It is uh, 2.02. Let's get started. Good afternoon. Welcome to our Newsmaker Series, which is hosted by the Center for Community and Ethnic Media here at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. I'm Errol Lewis. I'm an adjunct professor here at the J School. I'm also the political anchor at New York One News and host of the podcast, You Decide. Uh, joining me on today's panel are Kadia Goba of Brooklyner and Abu Tahir, a uh, proud and well-known and respected member of this uh, group uh, from Bangla Patrika and Time Television. The Newsmakers series is an on-the-record conversation between city leaders and our city's community and ethnic media, one of many programs offered by the Center for Community and Ethnic Media, which is an initiative of the school. You can find out more about the center at ccem.journalism.cuny.edu. You can also find out more from the center's co-directors, Jahangir Kadak and Karen Pinar, taking pictures here, uh, who are with us this afternoon. Uh, we're especially glad to hear today from Julie Menon, who is the director of the Census for New York City and Executive Assistant Corporation Counsel for Strategic Advocacy. If her name is familiar to you, it is because she formerly served as Commissioner of the Department of Consumer Affairs, and until recently was Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. In her new and current role, Menon's job is to organize extensive outreach efforts to encourage every New York City resident to participate in the upcoming 2020 Census. An accurate census count will ensure that New York gets its fair share of education, health care, housing, and infrastructure funding, and its proper electoral representation in Congress. The format of today's discussion is as follows. We're going to ask Ms. Menon to spend about five minutes on some opening remarks about uh, the current initiative she is undertaking. Uh, and then Kadia, Abu, and I will ask some questions. While that is going on, Jahangir will be circulating and collecting index cards. Uh, to get your questions, and we'll include those in the discussion as well. At the conclusion of the event, Ms. Menon will step outside the room for any news organizations that need to do a quick follow-up or take photos. The rest of us will remain for a short meeting to talk about next steps. So with all of that said, let's begin. Ms. Menon, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Errol, for that kind introduction. And I uh, really want to thank Queenie's Journalism School and all of you for being here and hosting me today, and to Kadia and to Abu as well. So I'm thrilled to take on these two new roles in the administration. As Errol mentioned, I am now director of the Census for New York City, and I also have a senior role at the Law Department as Executive Assistant Corp Counsel. With the census, uh, really, it's not an overstatement to say that there could not be more at stake. And I know that's such a trite thing to say, and you hear people say that all the time in different political ads and things like that. But I really believe this to be the case. And the reason why is we in New York City are fighting for our fair share of what will amount to over $7 trillion that the federal government allocates to municipalities and to states over the next decade. So if we don't get this right, this literally affects our funding over the next decade. And the funding that it affects specifically is over 300 social service programs. And it, it affects everything from public school education, public housing, Medicaid, SNAP, WIC, special needs funding, uh, infrastructure funding. There's almost no program that you could throw out that I could tell you did not relate directly to the census. And it's more than that, too. I will tell you as a mother that one of the perhaps um, most clear examples of why the census matters for our children is a New York City Health Department in a crisis looks to census data when they need to quickly respond. So for example, several years ago, there was a measles outbreak in Long Island City. Health Department looks at the census data and determined in 24 hours, this is a number of measles vaccines we need to deploy. If that number is wrong, you can see what the implications of that are. In addition, this also affects our congressional representation. We stand to lose up to two congressional seats statewide in an undercount. And um, so that's what we're dealing with here. And unfortunately, we are in a very difficult situation. And we're in a difficult situation for several reasons. First and foremost, for the first time in 70 years, there is a question on the census that says, are you a US citizen? The Trump administration has added this question 
Uh, we at the law department are plaintiffs on the lawsuit along with the attorney general's office and other states and municipalities. We won at the district court level in a very favorable ruling to the city of New York. Our case um, is uh, bypassing the appellate court and going straight to the Supreme Court on appeal with oral arguments in April. It is likely that the Supreme Court will be deciding this case by June because that is a deadline by which the Federal Census Bureau has said they must have an answer in order to print the forms. So what does this question mean? This question, and this is not an overstatement, is a blatant attempt to suppress response rate in immigrant communities and communities of color across the city. This is an attempt to defund cities, and not just New York City, but cities that have high immigrant populations, and to switch the funding to red states. So this is one of the reasons why we are suing. But in addition, the message that this is sending to our immigrant communities, and I say this as a daughter of an immigrant, my mom came here as a Holocaust survivor, is to say that your, your vote and your count does not matter, that funding for your community is not as important, and that is why we're standing up and suing on this, and we will go to the mat on that lawsuit. The other reason our job is complicated is because for the first time ever, you can respond to the census online. This is both good news and bad news. It's great news for the city because we are, when you first receive your mailer from the Federal Census Bureau in March of 2020, we will then have real-time data every 24 hours is the agreement that we have worked out with the Federal Census Bureau. So we will be able to see what neighborhoods in New York are responding and conversely what neighborhoods are not responding. So we'll really be able to quickly send in teams to be able to address that situation. Also, but the bad news is some people do not have a smartphone. Some people are in um, uh, Wi-Fi deserts around the city. We know that that's an issue, and that's why we're going to partner with our public library systems, community organizations on the ground to make sure that we always have access. We're going to create pop-up centers around the city with computers, with phones, where people can come in and respond. And we also know that oftentimes it's a trusted faith-based leader or community leader um, who people will listen to. And so that is why we're going to partner with organizations across the city on the response rate. One of the, um, and then I promise I'll wrap up because I think my time is done. Uh, one of the most interesting things to me is someone who's been involved um, in an out of city government for some time. I chaired um, Community Board One for many, many years and was the chair of the Community Board in 2010 during the census. Is during that time, no one from the city government or the state government or the federal government ever came to us and said, if you don't take the five minutes to fill out this form, did you know that funding for your local public school or your local senior center could be cut? No one ever delivered that message. Instead, the only message that we heard was from the federal government who said, it is the law, it is in the Constitution, it is your civic duty to fill this out. Well, you know what? That is not the most compelling message, in my humble opinion. We need to instead get the message out that New York must respond to this because we cannot have an undercount. In 2010, 61.9% of New Yorkers self-responded to the census. That compares to a national average of 76%. This is wholly inadequate. And as a result, we're leaving hundreds of millions of dollars on the table for vital services and basically just letting other jurisdictions have money that rightfully belongs to New York City. We are not going to do that again. And that is why this is really the first attempt by New York City government to engage in this broad-based census outreach. We are hiring a staff of about 50 people in our office. We're also working very closely with the federal census office to recommend to them candidates because they're hiring over 22,000 people. And we want to make sure that they're hiring people in communities and not do what happened in 2010, where they brought in many people from out of state to knock on people's doors. And that did not fare particularly really well. So there's so much more I can say. I believe my time is up, so I'm going to end it there, but I'm really eager to hear from all of you and answer your questions. Okay. And we do indeed have a lot of questions. We'll start with Kadia. Sure. I just feel like I want to continue and jump right in there about hiring different um, or people that might um, be more familiar with the respective community in which they're collecting that data. How do you go about, like, how are you hiring 
folk, um, how are you bringing people in there? Sure, so there's really two different um, hiring that we're doing. One is the city's hiring, where we're building our team of about 50 people. The majority will be community organizers, people who have deep level community experience on the ground, know those communities inside out. So that is really what we're looking for, so we're beginning that process now. Now the federal government is hiring uh, managers right now. These are jobs that pay up to $100,000. They're looking looking for managers, and so we are now recommending um, people to them because what happened, quite frankly, in 2010 is they were hiring people from North Carolina, nothing against North Carolina and other states, but you know what, these jobs should go to New Yorkers, to people who know their communities. So we don't want that to happen again. In addition, they're hiring 22,000 enumerators, which is a fancy word for door knockers. These enumerators um, are both part-time and full-time jobs. They pay $25 an hour. So once again, in 2010, brought in a lot of people from out of state. We do not want that to happen again. So we are now working on getting the word out that these jobs are open and urging New Yorkers to apply for them. And can I just follow up with how are you doing that in terms yeah. of what are you reaching out to local media? How are you contacting? So for the enumerators, they're not going to be brought on until the fall. People okay. can apply now, but the, the real outreach is going to happen over the summer, closer to the hiring date. The federal government is going to partner with us on doing job fairs around the city. We're also working with our sister agency, SBS, and the workforce development sites to make sure over the summer that we get the word out. We're also going to be reaching out to CUNY and to other schools uh, in the city because because these jobs are also part-time these are great jobs for students and so we want to make sure that we're getting the word out there as well that is um, a, a, a really good um, sort of opening conversation to have with New Yorkers like hey there's 22,000 jobs um, are, are are enumerators you said the they can apply now for jobs that'll go online in the fall. Where where do they apply? So they go onto the federal government website. Um, and the issue that I would just like caution right now is that the enumerator jobs, we're not encouraging people to apply right now for that, in large part because there's a 60-day onboarding, and we're a little bit concerned that if people apply now and they don't hear, that that can be you know an issue. Uh-huh. So, um, Okay. What when would be a more realistic? The summer. Day? So the summer. So we're really urging. And then I think you know at that point, and this is one of the things we're planning now with SBS, with the Federal Census Bureau, to have job fairs all over um, the city to really encourage that message. Um, but the city is hiring, and so let me just make sure that people know that we are hiring. Our team is obviously much smaller. It's about fifty people. Um, and then the other piece of this, obviously, is a community organization. So we're putting in a mechanism in place right now to re-grant to community groups because we are fully cognizant and fully appreciate that it is uh, largely community groups on the ground who uh, really are most familiar uh, with a lot of the outreach. And we want to make sure oftentimes in immigrant communities, they're the trusted voice in the community. So we right now are putting in place a granting mechanism so that in January of next year, we can be um, disseminating grants. Okay. I was, a, I was a census enumerator in the 1980 census. Wow. I was in high school. And it was uh, right before I went off to college. They give you a whole little package. You knock on doors and stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. Abu. Okay. Can I ask a follow-up question about the hiring, um, which is the people who... The people you are going to hire, what would be their status? Like they have to be a citizen or green card or they don't have to have Okay, this? so not for the city, but for the federal government at the moment, yes, that is what the Federal Census Bureau has said. And we're deeply concerned about that, obviously. I mean, it's the same thing with our citizenship lawsuit. This is a real issue. Okay, so th then my question is, you know, the if citizenship, um, you know, question include where the court, if court that denied the, you know, um, came mm -hmm. sue and mm -hmm. if they go ahead, mm -hmm. then how you are going to ensure the community, the people who has sure. to be included that, okay, they're 
yeah. uh, identity will not be shared with ICE or any other federal agency. So if we lose the case at the Supreme Court, um, we are then going to be really focusing on assuring people that Title 13 of the U.S. Code protects the confidentiality of the response. Title 13 is the, the section of the U.S. Code that indicates that a federal census employee cannot share that census data. And if they were to share the data, it subjects them to up to five years imprisonment and up to $250,000 fine. And by the way, that's a lifetime ban. So even if that employee next month you know, quits the government, it is a lifetime uh, ban that is imposed on them. So Title 13 is you know, very strong legal protection, and we want to make sure that people know that. And we also honestly want to make sure that people understand the funding piece. Because again, and I said this in my opening comments, the thing that has struck me the most in, in this process as I'm delving deeply into the census is how little New Yorkers know about that. I believe, and we've not polled on this, but I believe if we were to take a poll right now in New York City and ask people, you know, did you know that funding for your local public school is dependent on your community having a high response rate on the census, people would say no. They believe the census is just, oh, well, you count people people and this is what the government does and it happens every 10 years and that is why a lot of people quite frankly ignore it. So we plan on, literally I'll use a, a phrase my kids use, light a fire <laughs> under everyone to just say this is so important and to just take the five minutes to fill this form out. And it's not only funding for your community, it's also funding for the city as a whole. You know, some of these formulations like Medicaid that are a state allocation, you know, you're helping your neighbor, you're helping your local community, but you're also helping uh, other neighboring communities as well. The, the application of, of Title 13, are, have there actually been prosecutions of, uh, of census workers for disclosing? Um, no, it's, it's very interesting. So census workers have not um, tried to share that information, I think because it is so ironclad. There's also another section of the code where there have been three cases. There's a section of the code that says that if you encourage anyone to not fill out part of the census, like boycott certain parts of the census, that actually is a felony. And there have been three cases in that regard, none of which there was a successful prosecution on. So I just mention that because the, one of the most common questions that I'm asked is, well, why doesn't the city of New York just tell people not to answer the question? Well, there are really two reasons why we can't do that. And, and hopefully that's a moot point because hopefully we win our case in a couple months. But in the worst case, if, if we are faced with that issue, we can't do that. One, it's a felony for the city to do that. Two, from just a practical import, uh, if you tell people to boycott a question, people hear the word boycott, they're most likely to boycott the whole census. And that will have disastrous implications for the city of New York. We will lose literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of funding for some of the most important social service programs that we have. Do you mind take, oh, sorry, go oh, for it. Just so you want to know, you told us that about uh, $17 trillion of the budget. Um, sure, I can go into those budget, numbers right? okay. again. What is the budget of the city budget for, uh, for yeah. the census? And will you include the, you know, all the ethnic media here? Sure, uh, sure. Uh, print sure. media, television media. Uh -huh. Will you include uh, that media to spread out your message by advertisement and all that? Sure. Great question. So let me start first of all with what the seven trillion. Just to reiterate, the seven trillion dollar figure is a nationwide figure that the federal government allocates across the country over the next decade. We're fighting for our piece of that seven trillion dollars. Um, New York State receives fifty three billion dollars a year of funding in census related programs, and the city is a lion, you know, a lion's share of that funding. So I just wanted to quantify it for everyone. Okay, so what is our budget? So um, in the past year, uh, $4.5 million was allocated to this. What we're doing right now is we're in the process of putting together a budget for the mayor and for the city council. That is now will you know, be done in short order and work its way through the budget process. I can assure you that the mayor is deeply committed, as is the speaker, to the census, and I feel we're going to have a very good number to work with. 
um, in terms of your question about community and ethnic um, papers. And you know, this is something near and dear to my heart. When I was commissioner of media and entertainment, we gave a grant of a million dollars to this school specifically to do programming and training for um, community and ethnic uh, journalists. So I'm very proud of the work that we did there, and I really you know believe in it. So we will be taking ads out across the city in in papers and publications. We're going to be also doing TV ads, radio ads, digital ads. The advertisement is going to be critical, and I'm really excited about the advertising because for the first time we're going to do we're going to micro target these ads, and we're going to explain to people and communities this is what's at stake, so that we hopefully can break through all the clutter of information that people get on a daily basis and really go to the heart of this is why it matters. So for public school parents, explaining it's so important that you fill out the census. Um, in special needs communities, explaining that special needs funding uh, for students is completely reliant on the census. So that's the kind of ads that I believe we need to be able to do really across the board. It, you know, census funding also goes for infrastructure, so roads, tunnels, bridges. You know, in Rockaway or in the community I used to represent in Lower Manhattan, where emergency preparedness and resiliency is top of mind, we've got to give that messaging across. So that's the kind of micro-targeted messaging I'm interested in doing, and I really look forward to partnering with all of you in terms of our um, advertising. Are you going to do um, multilingual advertisement, or is it we, no, no, we have to do multilingual. Um, when I was Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, we launched paid sick leave in 25 languages. I will tell you the Federal Census Bureau has the census form in 12 languages. We believe that's wholly insufficient. There's nothing, we will not be able to get the federal government to change their language access. But what we did talk to them about and what they have committed to do is have the um, form in many other languages, not the actual form that you'll see on your computer, but a one-pager that explains it, at least in other languages. And we'll have that in our materials as well. Um, I think I'm going to pivot to online, since you brought up, um, for the first time in history, people will be able to take a, um, count themselves online. How does one ensure, I don't need to tell you, the security breaches that the country has sure. undergone throughout? the years. How does uh, the federal government or the city ensure that we're protected? Yeah, so that is a federal government issue. The city cannot uh, you know, get involved, and we don't have the jurisdiction or the access to get involved in the actual mechanism that the federal government is using to capture the data. But it's similar to when anyone responds to you know, other federal agencies, whether it be on health care or other issues. So we have been assured, we've raised this issue many times with the Federal Census Bureau on issues of cybersecurity and uh, privacy. They have assured us. And one of the things we've said to them is in messaging and town halls and all of that, they need to get very specific and granular on that issue sure. because I agree, it's something that definitely is top of mind for people. T to be clear, you don't only have to respond online. There are three ways now that you can, actually four, there are four ways you can respond. The first is online. Um, so in March of next year, every New Yorker will get a mailing um, in the mail from the Federal Census Bureau. 80% of New Yorkers on their mailing, there'll be a little computer code and they can go on their phone or go to their local public library or at work or wherever you want and just fill it out in five minutes, the end of that code, you are done. That's it. Or you can call, you can answer by phone. It's the first time ever that the Census Bureau is accepting by phone. So I personally think that's great and it's another mechanism. Then you can do the old fashioned way, which is you mail it in. And then when I said there's a fourth way, if you don't respond in March or April or May, then come late May, early June, an enumerator will knock on your door and or, you know, urge you to fill the census out and fill the census out with you. Do you have 10 most highest rated community ideas? Yes, well I have, I have all, I've brought all yeah, of yeah, them. Yeah. I have, I have all of them for you. <laughs> I can tell you, so maybe it's helpful if I um, announce some of the lower response rates and then some of the higher ones if that's helpful. So Erasmus. Um, 44.7%, um, you know, in Williamsburg, 45.5%. Uh, so the, they are on the lowest end. I mean, as Errol mentioned, the highest is Washington Heights at 77.5%. They had a very high response rate. 
uh, in the Orthodox Jewish community, they have one of the lowest response rates in the city. So that is something we're working very closely with the Jewish community to address that and to make sure we can counteract that. Um, but I have all of them, so if it's, I don't know that what you feel is the best way to, to get this out, but we can. Oh, okay, yeah, well, we can figure that out, sure. Whatever is most useful. But I think this is really important because people, most people have no idea what the response rate was in their community. And so I think it's really important. And then just to announce again, the nationwide self-response uh, average was 76%. So we are just so woefully behind in New York, and all we're doing is leaving money on the table that rightfully belongs to us and that we need. A disproportionate uh, percentage of these, including the five worst performing, are in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, mm, not good. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. Also, it, it doesn't necessarily track with income, right? I mean, I noticed that all. there were some some fast gentrifying neighborhoods, and maybe Correct. that's the reason. Correct. Not at all. And that, that's a really important messaging. I mean, again, and, you know, in speaking with community leaders and elected officials in Inwood and Washington Heights and Marble Hill that had, again, the highest response rate in the city in 2010, they were really proud of the fact that they uh, out-organized other neighborhoods, quite frankly. They went door to door. They held tons of town halls at every community meeting. And that's the thing that I'm telling people, that if you serve on a community board, I'm asking the community boards between March and July of 2020, can you announce at every single community board meeting, just for 60 seconds at the top of the meeting, have you filled out your census? There's such a role that all of you can play as journalists if during that answer period between March and July of having some message on the front page or somewhere, did you fill out the census? Because, you know, if, if we don't get this message across, then shame on us. We literally then are just shipping that money to some other jurisdiction. Okay, there are some questions from the audience that I would like to uh, forward. Um, will the New York City advertising agency, Miller Advertising, be executing the advertising program? Uh, that's a great question. We haven't made that decision yet. We're working on the budget right now um, in terms of the amount that we're going to do on TV, on radio, um, print ads, et cetera. So that decision hasn't been made yet. Okay. Um, this one you may or may not know. Do other countries ask about citizenship status in their census? Uh, that's a great question. I'm not an expert on what other countries are doing. I mean, obviously here in the U.S., what we're most concerned about is the fact that in 70 years, since 1950, this question has never been asked. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the legal case, uh, I mean, if you're interested in reading a fascinating legal opinion, read Judge Furman's opinion, uh, which you know uh, validated the city's uh, point of view and showed that Secretary Wilbur Ross, by adding this question, um, had violated the Administrative Procedures Act and acted in a way that was completely arbitrary and capricious and that had absolutely no basis in law. Um, with regard to the Supreme Court case, if I understand it, uh, what you said uh, correctly, you're saying you hope to win the case, uh, but even if you don't, there's a, uh, a messaging that can go out telling people there is a law that protects you because there's a lifetime ban on any census worker disclosing information. And the implication is that you believe that that would encompass, uh, that would be inclusive of releasing citizenship status data to another federal agency like ICE. Correct. It's absolutely prohibited by Title 13 of the U.S. Code. Uh, and so we will be messaging that if we lose the case at the Supreme Court. We, that is a message that we're going to spread all over New York City. But let me be clear. We are confident in the fact that the facts and law are on our side. With that said, one never knows what ends up happening. But you know, we were absolutely vindicated legally by Judge Furman's opinion. I mean, it, it sounds in some ways procedural, right? Like there is a path to the administration properly and lawfully getting that question on, if not this census, then the next, but uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Correct. I mean, from a legal standpoint, Judge Furman ruled on our administrative procedures claim, not on our constitutional claim, 
we did not win on the constitutional claim, which without spending hours talking about the legal weeds of this is we feel is actually creates a better path for us at the Supreme Court because it is very clear that uh, Wilbur Ross violated the Administrative Procedures Act. I mean, he acted in an arbitrary and capricious way. There was no reason to add this question. And in fact, what he did and what Judge Furman ruled on is that he came up uh, with an after-the-fact explanation for why it, he needed it and claimed it was the Justice Department that was asking for it for compliance with the Voting Rights Act, and that proved to be completely false. Okay, another question. Uh, is your office open to a creative form of advertising that includes ads plus editorial support? And uh, I'd add even a friendly amendment to that. Would that all, might that also include producing people to participate in co-sponsored forums? In other words, within different communities, the, the, the local uh, community paper or uh, radio station or TV station or online publication might be somebody that you could partner with. Absolutely, yes. We, we definitely want to do that. We need all the help we can get from all of you in spreading the message. You um, all work in an industry that people listen to, where people are paying attention to what you're writing about. And so we, we really want to be able to capitalize on that and partner together. Uh, related question, would you consider buying a booth at every street fair, mostly through bids, to uh, register or to count people? Not a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at a lot of different ideas between March and July. We're looking at creating pop-ups all across the city with computers where people can come in and fill the census out. We're looking at a lot of really creative ideas um, that we're not going to announce right now that we think are really hopefully going to help to spread the word. But we're, we're, we're completely open to ideas, so absolutely. Okay. I just, um, just for the record, <coughs> excuse me. Can you take us through the timeline yes. from the beginning to sure. end so everyone's sure. clear on that? Yes, absolutely. So what we're doing now is now we're in outreach. We're trying to spread the word about the census. The census is coming, letting people know. And then most importantly, we're working on establishing our office. You know, this office of the census didn't exist. So we're really, like I can't emphasize this enough, having run two city agencies that did exist where it's always easier to be able to hire people when you've got a pre-existing agency. Like we're literally creating this from scratch. So that's what we're working on um, right now. In 2020, in mid-March, every New Yorker will, as I said, receive in the mail a piece of mail from the Federal Census Bureau. 80% of New Yorkers will see a little code at the top, and um, it will say that you can fill this out online. And again, you go to that website and you can fill it out on your phone, on go to the library and fill it out at work, on, on, on any computer. If you lose your code, that's okay. There are, they have a mechanism by which you can enter certain data and they create a match. So it's okay if you, because that was one of my questions, what if you lose a code? <laughs> if you lose a code, that's okay. 20% um, of New Yorkers will receive the hard copy mailing in the first mailer and they can mail it in just the traditional way. If you don't respond to that first mailing, either with the online or the mailing, you get a second mailing. If you don't respond to that, you get a third mailing. If you don't respond to that, some people are gonna be also getting a fourth mailing. They're looking at doing a fourth one as well. If you don't respond, someone from the federal government will knock on your door. That is not good, because we don't want the enumerators to have to go out, why? for a couple of reasons. One is a lot of times, you know, they don't make contact with the person, the person's not home, they can't reach them, the, the, you know, it just creates problems in that regard. But two, it's the, the data is not as reliable. So there have been so many studies that have been done on that. When people fill out the census by themselves in that March, April, May period, that's called the self-response period. That is the most reliable data. When people, some stranger knocks on your door and asks you to fill this thing out with you, it's just frankly not as reliable. And so we don't want that as a city. We have to have an accurate count of how many children we have in the city for one of the reasons I gave you with the health department example. Like we can't have inaccurate data. So it's so important that we urge all New Yorkers to fill out during the self-response rate. And Julie, is there a hard deadline somewhere where yes. the total 
<laughs> well, by late May is the self-response deadline, okay. but then the whole census um, operation closes in the end of July. So we are done. The federal government is done. That's it. And then the information is, is sent to Washington. There you go. Okay. Um, so, as you mentioned that, uh, you know, the, um, the citizenship uh, question is still there. Mm -hmm. um, I was in Queen's Borough President, uh, you know, City of the Borough mm -hmm. President address, and she mentioned in her address that, you know, if this question is arise, then I am the person who will not, you know, fill up the form. Right. So if the resist, you know, um, increase and people get, uh, you know, um, resistance, mm -hmm. they have a resistance in that right. against this, uh, you know, um, uh, proposal, then how city will control the whole thing and what would be your message sure. to the people? No, it's a great question. Well, as <laughs> I said, the city is not going to tell people to boycott this question or that question because that's actually a felony, so we won't be doing that. However, it, people are free to answer what questions they want to answer. If you skip a question on the census, your form still is valid. If you skip many questions on the census, your form will not be valid and someone will most likely come and knock on your door. So for example, if someone decides that they don't want to fill out the gender question, they're not comfortable with it, they don't want to fill it out, you know, that is their prerogative. But the city can't be put in a position where we're urging people, boycotts this and that, because again, that is a felony and we're, we're, we're not going to do that. But people are free to answer the questions that they okay, wish so to answer. So the, the, if someone doesn't fill up the, uh, you know, uh, the line, which is citizenship line, still they will be counted? The census still counts, yes, if they don't fill out one question. If you, what the Federal Census Bureau has told us, look, if someone's not filling out three or four questions, that's probably not going to count, and they're probably going to send someone to the door because that's an incomplete form. Um, some more questions. Uh, do you know how the government decides who gets a paper ballot? Uh, no, they have just said that this is a random process. I, there's no sort of like predetermined this person gets it and this person doesn't. Most public libraries are closed on nights and weekends. Will the city support the libraries to, uh, I guess, extend their hours? to help people with the census? That's a great question. So I just met with all of the uh, public library heads um, for Queens, for Brooklyn, and the New York Public Library. We are working with them on a proposal to um, make sure that the libraries are central repositories and pop-up centers for the census. So we're, we are looking at that issue. I hear whoever asked that question, I hear that issue loud and clear. I understand that. Um, and so we are looking at that possibility. Um, as you can tell, there's a, th a theme going here. Uh, when do you expect census ads to start running? Not until next year. Um, we're going to put our advertising into 2020 when you can actually respond to it as opposed to in 2019. Gotcha. Uh, can you tell us w uh, what is the response rate of the New York City Chinese community in 2010? So that's kind of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, we can look up the response rate in Chinatown and in right. Um, yeah, I, in fact, I was making a note of that. Um, I did see um, Chinatown, 64.5. I saw um, Flushing. Uh, Flushing, 61.5. 61.5. And um, Sunset Park, I was looking for. They have, uh, you have a category for Sunset Park West. And that was um, 60.9. So, yeah. um, 60s is on the on the higher side for New York, right? Well, 61.9 percent was the citywide average. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. But compare that to 76 percent as a nationwide average. We have quite a ways to go. Well, you know, I, I did want to ask you about that. I get something. I just got my. I get this every month from Con Edison, and I understand it's a new sort of psychological tactic that sort of works, where they send you something comparing your electrical usage to um, the, the average, and then they compare you to households near you. And the idea is supposed to kind of make you think somewhat competitively in a positive sense, right. as opposed to saying, you know, you're wasting all your money on electricity and you're never gonna get that vacation that you want, you know? So it's like positive messaging uh, to sort of spur healthy competition. Maybe that is something- We are- totally on this issue. I can't emphasize this enough. We want to create a healthy competition among neighborhoods across the city. 
but a competition from beating the 2010 number, because we think that should be the metric, is trying to do better than that neighborhood did in 2010. There's not a neighborhood in New York City that can't do better. No one was at 100%. Everyone has room to improve. And we believe if we can really try to create that um, uh, fire and that excitement and that um, urgency about why this matters, we'll be able to do that. We have well over 60,000 homeless people in New York City. Can you walk through how you count them? Yes. So the federal, so, and, and just to be clear, again, the city is not the one that does the count. The federal government does sure. the counts. I just want to make sure everyone knew that. So the federal government has three days that they do um, outreach, totally dedicated outreach for the homeless population to make sure that the homeless are counted. Um, and so they have, and that's what they've done in the past censuses as well. So they are um, committed to do that. When you say three days, that's like a sort of a, a straight enumeration person by person? Or in this case, wouldn't the city be able to say, we checked in 63,000 into shelters last night, so let's, let's start you with those. The city is absolutely going to have to help with that, and we plan on being a critical component of that, working very closely with HRA. Um, what is important is that uh, it's happening over the course of three days, so it's not one day, because our concern would have been, and like one day would not be um, helpful. Like we want to make sure it's spread out over a number of different days. Um, do you have a statistic of the community-wise, like you know, say about Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Indian, how many uh, you know people are living? in different community, do you have a statistic of this? Well, we do, so we have at the Department of City Planning and Joe Salvo is our chief um, uh, demography officer, it's his uh, fifth census, I believe. Um, yeah, we told him he can't leave. He can't leave this time until we're done. Uh, but he does have that information. So if there's specific questions, um, Katerina, do you mind raising your hand? Katerina, who works with me, uh, we can get you that information. Oh, okay. And how, what is your target uh, to, uh, fulfill the you know census. I mean, in terms of the keep yeah. the New York City congressional uh, you know um, right. seats and other. How many people do you need to uh, well, you know? You know that is a that that's an excellent question and that's very hard to answer. It has been estimated that if there is a severe undercount, we could lose up to two congressional seats, one in the city, one upstate. But it's it's very hard to make those precise predictions so I, I don't I don't want to do that but that's the fear that we have if there is an, an undercount and also I would just say that it's not only happening in New York I mean the idea that there could be a seismic sea change in the balance of the Electoral College as a result of the citizenship question I mean let's just be clear what this is really about and will you be available uh, if any media want to interview you uh, you know, newspaper or television, whoever, you know, would oh, it be available? Absolutely, absolutely. Has the city considered giving some sort of bonus or award to areas with the best response rates? Yeah, that is a wonderful question. So unlike with voting where there can never be an incentive, with the census there actually can legally be an incentive. So we are looking at creative ways to get neighborhoods um, engaged uh, by the census and so we plan on in 2020 announcing a number of very specific ideas uh, really focused on um, I, I'm not going to give away like sort of all these we've got a lot of ideas yet and we're not ready to announce them yet but just in that vein of making sure that people understand what's at stake but also knowing their ways to get people galvanized in their community around this cool um, how could, uh, <laughs> how, how long will the 2020 census take an individual to complete from start to finish? It's estimated no more than 10 minutes, generally five minutes. It's, it's, very, it, it's uh, uh, very short. These are not lengthy questions. Um, they're very easy to answer. It, they're um, completed by the so-called head of household. Um, anyone who is staying in that unit is supposed to be counted. So if there is someone who's 
sleeping on the couch for you know many 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 months they need to be counted if you have a student who might be away from home for a bit but who's coming back they need to be counted so it's really supposed to be a snapshot in time that captures everyone who is living in that particular household you, you know another uh, piece of positive messaging as you say that my uh, my sister who is our family historian has found out an immense amount of information, and it's all based on census data, going all the way back to the 1850s. Um, yeah. You know, for for people who care about that sort of thing, for posterity, right. you know, you never know who's going to use the data. It's not just about the immediate needs for the government, but also for your own family, your own uh, descendants. Yeah, no, that's really a great point. And the other point that that makes me think of is is going back to the example. Errol, that you mentioned about Washington Heights, you know, one of the um, things that's mentioned uh, to me several times by elected officials in Washington Heights is that they took great pride in making sure that the numbers in the Dominican community were as high as possible and making sure that everyone was counted. And so I think that there is great pride that people feel in filling out the census. For the LGBT community, for the first time, the census questionnaire recognizes same-sex households. So that's something we really want to message out and make sure that people are aware of that. Um, since the way the state of New York is counted in for congressional representation, and I guess the Electoral College as well, um, how will New York City work with New York State to ensure an accurate count? Meaning, are your part? Do you have a counterpart in the state? Yeah. So I've been meeting with um, a, a counterpart, the uh, um, Rich Toby, who's the senior advisor to Governor Cuomo, and he's in charge of the census. He's not the census director. He works on other projects, but he's in charge of census. Um, I've also spoke. I was up in Albany two weeks ago speaking to the New York State Conference of Mayors. So all the mayors of New York statewide to because we're all in this together and we want the state number to be as high as possible again on so many different formulations this is going to be absolutely critical on medicaid on infrastructure and so really making sure that we're working collaboratively across new york state mm -hmm. you talked about lgbtq residents um counting as a household the same household mm -hmm. for the first time are there any other first on the uh, census this year there are not a lot of changes to the census form, but that really is one that, that is incredibly important and that we, we think there's not been a lot of media attention to that, and so we really want to get that out there. Uh, do you have any idea how many undocumented uh, people are living in New York City or New York State, whatever? Yeah, I mean, the, the statistics from um, MOYA, the city agency uh, on the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, is approximately 600,000. And so we really want to make sure that we have every undocumented person in New York City counted. I mean, the administration has made a high priority um, making sure that our undocumented New Yorkers are supported, whether it was from municipal ID or other services that the city has provided, that's gonna be a very critical piece of this. Mm -hmm. And what would, be a, what would be the most challenge to fulfill the requirements of uh, you know, census? I Sorry. mean, what would be the challenging thing? I mean, what is the, mo the severe challenge to, yeah. um, you know, our biggest challenge yeah. it's, I mean there are many challenges uh, the citizenship question is obviously top of mind we will have an answer on that in June um, the online capability and making sure that people understand that and then to me it's like making people aware of what's at stake this is one of the most important and critical issues that the city of New York faces and I just firmly believe if we pulled on this that would not be at the top of the list people would put all of these different issues education and other uh, senior centers um, public safety emergency preparedness r infrastructure well you know what all these things relate to the census and so no matter what issue it is that New Yorkers care so deeply about and uh, that affect their daily lives it, it then taking the five minutes to fill this out there couldn't be a more important thing that New Yorkers could do than that and so that's really the message that I would leave uh, with all of you because you will do an enormous service to the city of New York and to your neighbors and to your own families by urging people to take the five minutes to fill this out.
Um, this is a question, it's actually, I guess it's more aimed at me since I raised this thing. You mentioned the ability to research ancestors. What kinds of assurances can we give that the identities of respondents and personal details will remain confidential? To which I found an answer on the census website. The 72 year rule. The National Archives releases census records to the general public 72 years after census day. As a result, the 1930 census records were released April 1st, 2002. The 1940 records were released April 2nd, 2012. The 1950 census records will be released in April of 2022. So 72 years for, for those who wanna um, have that discussion with your, uh, with your audiences. Um, I guess as a, a concluding, uh, since we only have a few more minutes, what's the most important message that you want each of these folks uh, to take forward now. I understand we'll, we'll change the message as we get closer to um, hiring dates and release of the forms, but what's the, what, what uh, do you want to convey right now? It's awareness. I mean, we have very limited time to reach every single New Yorker and making sure that they know that the census is coming. So rather than the traditional view of the census, which is just the law and fill this thing out, which I, we, we want to put that aside. That's not to us the most compelling message. It's it, to us, it's about the funding, certainly the congressional representation, but fundamentally the funding that New York City uh, could lose. And it's about owning the, your city's future. You know, we want to galvanize all New Yorkers, but certainly, like we're talking to a lot of students about this. This census is gonna affect the next 10 years of every New Yorker's life. So whether it's the parent who worries about the security of the city for their children, whether it's a senior who has concerns about whether their senior center is gonna remain open or not, whether it's a young person in school who's concerned about you know, getting jobs and infrastructure and all of that, this is the city's future. There's really nothing more important than this. And I, for one, as someone who's been in, in and out of the private sector and the public sector for a very long time, I'm honestly completely shocked that so many New Yorkers don't know this. And so that to me is a sense of urgency we have. It's really a novel issue. We're trying to run, honestly, the largest campaign that the city has seen to get people to do something that really is pretty straightforward, taking the five minutes to fill this out. But the awareness is, our, is a huge challenge for us. Mm -hmm. Um, when it's time to sh shift to a new phase, like hiring, um, and when it's time to shift, certainly as we get closer to some kind of a countdown to the actual release of the, the paper forms and the opening of the website and the response in earnest, we're gonna be in the middle of 2020 and there'll be a lot of other messaging. Um, so I hope you'll come back and sort of help us um, direct that. And. Uh, uh, I'm assuming and hoping that you're gonna win your case, uh, but if it goes the other way, um, much of the mainstream media is going to simply focus on that. The Trump administration won, they've put this hostile question into the census, it's gonna drive down response rates, you know, and there's a, a point at which that be, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that we, you know, we'll push back against it, but we're, we're local, we're community, we're not, you know, we're not CNN. Um, how, how do we deal with that? It's a great question. Well, on the legal side, uh, first of all, people's information is completely confidential, and so we have to hammer that home so that people have the assurances they need if we do not win our case at the Supreme Court. But moving beyond that, it's about understanding like are we going to let the Trump administration win? Are we going to let them defund New York City and move this funding to red states? Is, is that what we as New Yorkers are going to do? I don't think so. I think we're going to stand up and fight this. And so it is our fervent belief that if for any reason we do lose this case, we are going to go to the mat to make sure that every New Yorker fills this out and that we send a loud and clear message to the Trump administration that your tactics to try to take funding away from our great city did not succeed. Okay, um, do you have any um, idea about the age, the people you are, you are going to hire, 
whether minimum or maximum age of the people. No, no we, we, that's not lawful. We can't do that. <laughs> okay. okay. And then, then um, the uh, training, you know, the people who will hire, will you have a facility that you will train them or? Yeah, we are going to be doing training both on the census and for community organizations because many community organizations ask, just as you did, so many great questions. And so we want to make sure that we're doing training. We're going to do webinars and really make sure that people are very informed. And here's a question. Why do you think President Trump is specifically asking to add the citizenship question? That's a great question. It, this is, in my belief, a war on immigration. And I think I said in my opening remarks that my mom came here as a Holocaust survivor. She hid in a cellar in Budapest and then came here. My mother and grandmother survived. My grandfather and our other family members did not. So I take this issue very personally. There is, I'm not saying anything that we all don't know and read about every day in the press. There is a war on immigrants in this country. And this is one piece of it. And that's that's why it's so important that the city have a concerted effort to fight back against this. And that's why, to the point that Errol raised earlier, you know, we have to send a loud and clear message to the Trump administration that they're not going to succeed in suppressing the rights of immigrants in our city. Okay. That is going to be the last word. Uh, please join me in thanking Julie Menon. That was Thank very, so very informative. Thank you. Thanks a lot. For having me. Um, what often happens is people are going to. Uh, the paparazzi are now going to descend on you. And we find that it works easier if you step out in the hallway so everybody can give you a nice little gaggle. Thanks a whole lot.